the Italian government for the surrender of the offenders. Payment of 100 head of cattle for the offence committed by Messier Smith and Dayton. Surrender of the Swazi chief and Berlin and uh, others to be named hereafter and to be tried by the Transvaal courts. Observance of the coronation promises that the Zulu army be disbanded and men allowed to go home. That the Zulu military system will be discontinued and other military regulations that adopted to be decided upon after consultation with the Great Council and British representatives. That every man who comes to a man's estate shall be free to marry. All missionaries and their converts who, until 1877, lived in Zululand shall be allowed to return and reoccupy their stations. All such missionaries shall be allowed to teach, and any Zulu who chooses shall be free to listen to their teachings. A British agent shall be allowed to reside in Zululand, who will see that the above provisions are carried out. All disputes in which missionary or Europeans are concerned shall be heard by the king in public and in the presence of the resident. No sentence of expulsion from Zululand shall be carried out until it has been approved by the resident. Ketchwile did not attempt to avoid war with the British, or at least dull its eventual scope. His troops were given specific orders only to defend their country and not to take the fight into British territories. Only soldiers in uniform would be allowed to be killed, as well as no collateral damage was deemed acceptable. The British invasion. Sound effect. The borders disputes between the Zulu and Boers served as the pretext for war. When Ketchwayo gave no response to Barter Freel by the 11th of January 1879, a British force led by Sir General Frederick Augusta Tosiga, 2nd Baron Chelmsford, invaded Zululand on Barter Freel's authority without authorisation from the British government. The commander in chief of the British forces during the war would be Lord Chelmsford. His initial plans involved a five pronged invasion of Zululand with over 15,000 troops designed to force the Zulu army into a confrontation by circling them. They were concerned the Zulus were going to attempt to avoid a full-on battle. However, when it came to the actual invasion, Lord Chelmsford decided to reduce the number of forces to three, a large centre force under his direct command and two columns flanking on either side. On the 11th of January, they crossed the Buffalo River into Zululand. The three columns were invaded from the Lower Tulaga, Rourke's Drift and Uktrakt. Their objective, however, were the same, Alundi, the Zulu capital. Ketchwaya army outnumbered the British. It's true, but it wasn't a strict numerical advantage. The army numbered around 35,000 men. It was essentially a militia force called out when there was a national danger. It could only be activated for a few weeks at a time. But before then, they were forced to return to their civilian duties. They were primarily armed with Sengi thrusting spears known as Ikwi, clubs and throwing spears and shields made out of cowhide, hardly a match for the trained and equipped British soldiers. All three British columns were first unopposed. By the 22nd of January, Lord Chelmsford's centre column was camped near in southern Dorani. That morning, he split his forces. Some he sent out on rec recognition mission, leaving the camp in charge of his subordinate, Colonel Pauline. Waiting for them at the Zulu army was nearly 20,000 soldiers led by Cozy. Division, divisional force led by Chelmsford eastward while the main force attacked the camp. Chelmsford had not set up a camp defensively before leaving, ignoring both British policy and information that the Zulus were nearby. This decision helped directly led to the greatest victory of the Zulu kingdom to achieve during the war, the Battle is of Isandwani. The British forces were entirely wrecked by the Australian surprise attack. Its camp was destroyed with heavy casualties and the loss of supplies, ammunition and means of transportation. 
It took 10 hours of ferocious fighting to even secure the border post of Rourke's Drift after some Zulu reserves mounted an unauthorised raid. Chelmsford had no choice, he had to retreat back to British soil. The right flank, by comparison, was having more success. Colonel Charles Pearson crossed the Tugela River and managed to break up a Zulu impi that was attempting to set an ambush. Pearson managed to advance as far as Esho and a deserted missionary station, which he set up about fortifying. However, upon learning of the destruction of Deswani, he made plans to retreat back to British territory, but the Zulu army cut off his supply lines and began besieging his position. The left flank under Colonel Evelyn Wood had the task of occupying the northwest forces of Zululand preventing from them from engaging the central column. They had set up camp at Tintan's Kral and were planned to attack a force of 4,000 Zulus on the 24th of January. But again, once the news of Issa Noani reached them, they decided to withdraw. In only one month, and only one of the three flanks of the British army effective and too small to amount any campaign by itself. The first invasion of Zululand had been a, a, a complete failure. Ketchawaya did not press his advantage, and it was never his intention to invade Natal, only to defend the border boundaries of Zululand. That gave Chelmsford two months, two months he used to rebuild his forces. Using the excuse of Pearson's being seized at Eshel, he received seven regiments of reinforcements as well as two artillery batteries from the British government. They arrived on the 7th of March and by the 29th, Lord Chelmsford was marching to Eshel's relief with more than 5,000 soldiers in his command, this time setting up entrenched camps upon the way. So Evelyn Wood was ordered to take his troops and attack Abishkwali Zulu at their stronghold in Hoban. That didn't go as well as planned, however. The Zulu main army, numbering 20,000 strong, approached to add support. The British was forced to retreat, chased by a 1,000 Zulus of the Kabasushi, ranking up 225 casualties on the way. The next day, Wood was attacked by 20,000 Zulu warriors, outnumbering by almost 10 to 1 at their camp at Kambala. The attack was apparently issued without Ketchwaya's permission and was a failure. The Battle of Kambala lasted five hours with over a thousand Zulus killed and only British losses were 80. While Woods was fighting that force, Chelmsford continued his march against Ishawi, repelling soaps along the way. They relieved Pearson's besieged men on the 3rd of April and two days later they evacuated the fort, after which the Zulus burnt it to the ground. Despite their rescue of the force at Eshel and their success at Kambala and Gindaluvu, the British were back where they started. Nevertheless, there was a pressing reason for Charlesford to continue pressing his attack. He was being replaced and he wanted to inflict a decisive defeat on Quechuayo before that. With reinforcements amounted to 16,000 British and 7,000 African troops, he reorganised and recognised once more and in June began advancing into Zululand, this time being extremely careful, building fortified camps every step of the way. Ketchway attempted to negotiate a peace treaty at this point. The reinforced British were being a formidable opponent, and while the advantage was even, he attempted to end the fighting. Chelmsford, however, was eager to restore his reputation before being relieved. Thus, on the 4th of July, the force met at the Royal Crown uh, of Lundy and Ketchwell was delivered a divisive defeat. After the battle, the Zulu army dispersed. Most of the remaining chiefs submitted to British forces. Ketchwell himself became a fugitive. Chelmsford's work was done. He was, was replaced by Sir Garnet Wolseley for the final operations. On the 28th of August, the king was captured and sent to Cape Town, where he was formally deposed. Wolseley quickly discarded Bartok Freer's confederation scheme. His idea was to divide Zuland into 13 separate chiefdoms. 
headed by chiefs loyal to the British Empire. This, the Zulus were being able to unite as one unit under a single king, ensuring internal divisions and civil wars. Thus, Shaka's dynasty was finally ended and the Zulu country divided and proportioned out. Chelmsford received a knight, Grand Order Cross of Bath, largely because of his capture of Lundy. However, he never would serve in the field again after criticism of his handling of the situation. Bartlefield was left with a minor post in Cape Town. Bishop Colenso interfered with the British government on behalf of Ketchwire and succeeded in having him released from captivity on Reuben Island and returned to Zuland in 1883. The eventual communication between the new tribal chiefs and the British government ended up causing a great deal of bloodshed and disturbance. In 1882, the British government decided the best move would be to restore Ketchwayo to the throne. Unfortunately, in the meantime, blood feuds had risen among the chiefs. One side supported the chiefs of Isambupuli and Manu, Mani, and the other side supported the former king. When Ketchwayo was restored to power, Oshipu kept his territory, but additional land bordering and tar ended up becoming a reserve, a place for Zulu un unwilling to serve the restored king. This new agreement ended up providing futile gain, and Oshipu and Kishore soon ended up fighting another. Oshipu was victorious on the 22nd of July 1883, sending Kishore out of power for good. Um, again, more sound effects, and then the end. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast. As ever, we rely on the generosity of our readers and listeners. Please share with your friends and family. Use your social media sites to talk about the podcast. Please leave comments. And if you would like me to talk about any other uh, wars or histories, then please contact us. Look at the show notes for further details. Thank you. Uh.